Terry Riken Realtor at Sotheby's proudly presents Ken Boxer Live. Hi, I'm Martin Cove, and you're watching Ken Boxer Live on TVSB. And we're bringing in Ken Boxer for the next Sensei in Karate Kid 5. Uh, if you come and join us in the audience, you can, um, you can watch him train. <laughs> From the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, it's Ken Boxer Live with your host, Ken Boxer, and co-host, two-time Olympian Ty Babylonia. Please welcome Ken and Ty. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to Ken Boxer Live. I'm Ken Boxer. And tonight my co-host Ty Babylonia is not joining us. She had another commitment to make, but she'll be with us on our next show. And this is the most exciting week. In fact, the last two weeks, it's, we're in full swing with the film festival. And our show was actually on the red carpet. We met uh, Michael Keaton and also Jeff Bridges. And I guess tomorrow we're going to be meeting uh, Sylvester Stallone. And we'll be bringing that to you in the next few weeks. Also tonight, a very special guest on our show. You'll remember him from the Karate Kid movies. Uh, you'll remember him from Rocky, it's not Rocky, Rambo 2, as well as, as the television show Cagney and Lacey. He's a double black belt. He's been in over 80 movies. On our show tonight, everybody, Martin Cove is with us. And stay with us. Don't you dare turn that dial. Martin Cove, right after this. Ken Boxer Live, brought to you in part by... Margerum Wine Company, handcrafted wines and committed to excellence. Harbor View Inn, welcome to Santa Barbara's premier four diamond luxury boutique oceanfront hotel. The Wine Cask, serving seasonal California cuisine with Santa Barbara's largest wine list. Now back to Ken Boxer Live. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Welcome back. Joining us tonight is Martin Cove, the very talented actor in film and television. Martin is probably best known for his work in The Karate Kid, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, and on the television series Cagney and Lacey. And our guest has appeared in over 80 films. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now welcome Marty Cove. Welcome. <laughs> This is not the first time you've been in Santa Barbara. You've been here before, yes? Well, I love Santa Barbara. I mean, there are so few places on the planet you can spend 10 minutes to the left and go to the ocean and 10 minutes to the right, get on a horse and go up in the hills. You know, it's been my favorite town, you know, forever. I have lots of friends who live here. My good friends, uh, uh, Bernie and Laurie Sandler and Jim Green and Mark Pacino, producers I've worked with friends managers and you know it's always a gas to come here all the time well, we're glad you're here let's go back in time I did some research and learned that you were a math teacher I, you, know, I, you know math no one would have thought that you were teaching math how did you go from math teaching to acting you know that that is on the back of these playing cards <laughs> that was on I think IMDB I don't know how that ever evolved. So it's not true. No, no, no. I had a 35 <laughs> in geometry. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, the passing grade was 65, and I took geometry okay. twice, and then finally passed it after a temper tantrum with a very vulnerable high school teacher. <laughs> but um, no, I don't know how that got started. You know, and uh, I have problems to this day with isosceles triangles. And you know, and yeah. so everyone who can watch this show, who the person who put that in on the internet probably laughing every time there's a show and that's being brought up. There's this fellow Bill Haber, I think he was on Saturday Night Live and he tells a story all the time on every, I must have, I hear it on every talk show, anything he guest stars, he says that I drove him around and went in and bought a, 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 uh, a malt and asked him <laughs> if he wanted one and he drove me to the set for some movie and 
I went in, bought them all for myself, came out in a very inconsiderate fashion, and said, you know, nothing for you, sorry. And he tells this story, and it's really interesting, because <laughs> it's not the kind of thing I do. Uh -huh. You know, you, you go in, you, your driver's driving you around, and you've got a few extra minutes, you want, I would not buy him something, you know. So you hear these strange stories that go around. And right. Well, let's talk about what you did before acting. Uh -huh. Some of the, what are some of the odd jobs that you did? You remember, you're in New York, for instance. Well, it's very funny you were mentioning Sly. Um, Sylvester Stallone, Stallone and I had the same German clockmaker who was our personal manager in New York in the early 70s. His name was Kuno Spoonholtz. <laughs> and Sly Great and I, name. we got to be friends, and he was doing, I think he was Lords of Flatbush, and, and I wanted that, and I was doing something else in New York. And he would get Sly jobs as like an usher at the Baronet Theater on Third Avenue. Mm -hmm. And he would get me a job as a Santa Claus in Abraham and Strauss. <laughs> and it was really bizarre because you'd do those jobs and you start off as an actor and you do some strange things, you know. Well, where'd you get your training for acting? I guess, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to be an actor from the fourth grade on. So I would always be in plays. But I was, well, I think go, I was. Wait, let's go back. I, I don't want to interrupt, but I am interrupting. Fourth grade, what were you doing in fourth grade that would have you thinking acting? I did a play called The Golden Goose. I'll never forget it. Okay. The Golden Goose. And I just loved it. And that's when I really fa felt so comfortable on stage. And every year I would become part, back in Brooklyn, I would become part of a uh, stage play. And I auditioned for the high school performing arts. And I remember auditioning and I chose I chose Caligula at the age of 12. <laughs> I'll never forget this. I chose Caligula, you know. Uh, and then I chose another one. I think it was Sunrise at Campobello, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I was 12, you know. And, and the teacher said, why did you choose these different things? And I said, well, I chose Caligula because I identified with the insanity of the character. I didn't know what I was talking about. So, <laughs> so... I, I didn't get into the high school performing arts until maybe my second audition. But it just kept going and working at Classical Stage Company and then working at Lincoln Center and working at Cafe La Mama in New York. And it all just bred itself into a, a, a strong background and education, you know, to try and go out to the West Coast and, and make some movies and but do some Did you think television. you could make a living doing it back then when you were... Um, working in New York? Yeah, I, I, I did. It never was an issue. You know, it never was an issue. Could I make a living? It was, I was a fantasist and I believed in, you know, that I had something at that time. I, I, I just believed that I had something that could be very interesting to capitalize on with the camera on me. You know, until I met people like Robin Williams, those people really, you know, Jim Carrey, mm -hmm. they're so very special, you know, and Michael Keaton, I mean, they can go comedy and drama. But at that time, I was very young. I just felt confident that I had something to offer show business. Well, when did you know you were good? From what, when people were, the feedback from people? Or did you have it in, in you that you were really good? I don't know, you never think you're good, you know? <laughs> Come on, he's great. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. A wonderful performance. You, know, you watched Karate Kid, and it's iconic, and it's the 30-year anniversary. And you go occasionally and do some um, autograph shows or personal appearances, and the people know the lines: sweep the leg, no mercy. <laughs> and when I was doing that, you know, I was in the middle of a break on Cagney and Lacey. So to me, it was just another heavy. And you don't realize how much it meant, until today, in the last couple of years, how much it's meant to so many people who either had a bad romance as a kid, were bullied as a child, mm -hmm. or just had um, a fish out of water situation. And everyone identifies with that. And the iconic script written by Robert Kamen, to me, the star of the entire movie is not Pat, Marita, or um, or Ralph Macchio. It is Robert Kamen who wrote those words, you know. But you and said much of your lines were ad-libbed, right? A lot of the lines were ad-libbed, but John Avelson had, John didn't give me much direction. 
but he watched my behavior that it was all very dark, you know, and the key eye I used was of, of um, Pat Johnson, who was the stunt coordinator, who was the referee at the end of the movie, and he ran with Chuck Norris in the 60s and 70s in the tournament scene around the world. And I copied his key eye, I copied his stance in there, you know, standing here. A variety of behavioral issues were completely copied and it fell into Crease. It fell into John Crease's character. We talk about, uh, just very briefly, because we're gonna show a clip, we'll kind of lead to it, the audition that you had. Because it was very, you told me before the show um, how you were very angry <laughs> during the audition. Well. For the know, part of you, you, Karate Kid. You really want to prepare and do your best. So the casting lady said to me, Caro Jones, she says, um, can we curse here? Are we allowed to curse here? We're cable, right. go okay, ahead. Good. <laughs> good. <laughs> so she said, you'll have a week with the script. So I'm doing the scene, Mercy is for the week, here and on the streets, up and down the JoJo. And she calls me the next morning and she says, they want to see you on the set now. So I said, really? And she says, yeah, it's now or never, 12 o'clock, the next day. So I was livid and my, my wife, she had said to me, use that, how you feel right now towards this casting person, use it for mercy is for the weak here and on the streets, just take it. And I went in there and I berated John Avelson, the director, directed Rocky, Joe, you know. I said, you know, John, we wait for years to meet directors of your caliber. You know, we fire our agents, we fire our managers just to get to this level, and now you don't give me any time with this. You're a real asshole, <laughs> and so are you, Caro Jones. Mercy is for the weak, here. And I went right into it. They loved it. Sends me to Jerry Weintraub, who, Jerry's a great producer, produced right. Ocean's Eleven, Diner, every Heavyweight. The heavy guy, great guy. I do the same thing to him. I said, Jerry, you're supposed to be here four days ago. It, I'm on pins and needles for this interview. You're a real asshole, Jerry. <laughs> and so are you, Carol Jones, who wasn't even in the room. And mercy is for the week. And you get the part. I couldn't do it to the studio head. I got chicken with the studio head, so I just kind of like well, made believe he was in the bathroom. Let's watch a clip. Let's watch Martin Cove in The Karate Kid. You lose concentration to fight and you're dead meat. Yes, Sensei. What? Yes, Sensei. We do not train to be merciful here. Mercy is for the weak. Here, on the street, in competition. A man confronts you, he's the enemy. An enemy deserves no mercy. What is the problem, Mr. Lawrence? Hey, come on, let's forget this. Wait, not yet. What are you here for, old man? Come ask, leave boy alone. What's the matter? The boy can't take care of his own problems? One to one problem, yes. Five to one problem. Too much ask anyone. Is that what's bothering you? The odds? Name a place. Tournament. <laughs> you got real nerve, old man. But I think we can accommodate you. Ask one more small request. Make it fast. Ask leave boy alone to train. <laughs> You're a pushy little bastard, ain't you? But I like that. I like that. All right. No one touches the prima donna until the tournament. Is that understood? Yes, yes Sensei! But you don't show. And it's open season. Hunt him. Just joining us. Now, you, I heard that you actually were injured. There's a scene that was. See how excited I get when I. <laughs> You're okay. I see myself 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, you really want to look like that again, eh? Uh, you know. Well, yeah. you're okay. It looks no, good. No, I can't even hold a cup. <laughs> okay. But you, um, you had uh, an injury on the your hand. I, I was told in my research that. You, and that, I guess it was Karate Kid 2, 
you put your hand through the window, which was really the ending of for Karate Kid 1. Yeah. What was that all about? Well, the, the Karate Kid 1 was originally scripted to end in the parking lot where Karate Kid 2 begins. So we were there back in 1983, 84 in the parking lot, and we stayed there for three hours, and came, word came, it's a wrap. They decided to end the movie in the tournament. So unbeknownst to any of us, three years later, we're on the same parking lot. And uh, the action, action sequences uh, were to be, the first thing was me going over the shoulder of Pat Morita into a van. And we practice and practice and practice for hours a day, do this correctly. And the window is supposed to shatter, so it shatters one inch before your fist reaches. Real glass. And there's a charge in the window. Well, rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal, it never, I just stopped lunging and right. I just started just to punch because I didn't trust the special effect. Whether you notice everyone that punch, it's that karate, the yeah. twisting. Okay, go ahead. Well, you know, <laughs> because if you lunge and punch, you have a lot more force, and whew, that's the way the scene re was rehearsed. And I figured, well, I'm not going to be able to hold this punch if I throw my body as well. Mm -hmm. So I just snapped and snapped and snapped, and the glass never broke. So finally he says, it'll do it. I've got it. Let's roll the cameras. Roll the cameras. It doesn't break. I go right through the glass and with force and shards sticking out of my hand and it was bloody, really bloody. So when we're seeing the blood, that's your actual blood? No, the, the blood way? coming out, we shot the next day. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the magic of Hollywood. We, we shot it the next day. And, but going in, you know, mm -hmm. is yes. real. <laughs> One take we had. So I looked at John One and we, we did the you know, new, new, uh, the new skin on my knuckles. An hour later, we tried it again. And I just trusted it because you get your adrenaline pumping as an actor. You know, you're willing to do anything. So we, one more take. Roll it, action. I snap and I don't lunge. I just punch. Still doesn't break. I stop right at the glass. I turn around to John Avelson and I said, John, this is not the hand of the Terminator, of Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> this is real flesh. He says, you're right, it's a wrap. All so right. how it worked out is going in is real. Coming out was just blood the next day. But it's a story that everybody, you know, everybody tells because it was bloody. But you know, and people see you on the street. You have a funny story with you and um, William Zabka, who played Johnny, were walking through <laughs> some building, right? And something happened. Why don't you tell, we just a few minutes before our next clip, if you can tell us well, what that was about. William Zachary and I, we do some personal appearances and um, for you know promotional um, reasons. And uh, sometimes they'll screen Karate Kid and it's for charity and all. So one time we were, had four guards around us and we're walking and we're in black shirts. And one of the people who was working for the, the, the group there sneezed. And he sneezed a little on my shoulder. And we were walking through. And I, could, I looked at his face, and he just crumpled all the way into the corner, like, please don't hurt me, you know? And it wasn't a matter of that he was embarrassed he sneezed. Right. He was truly feeling that I would just lash out at him <laughs> and hit him and bury him right there in the hallway. And to me, I, I went over to Billy, I said, did you see that? He says, yeah. I said, that's an interesting, it's an interesting right. result of a character where you, people really, he really did think that I was John Kreese, that by sneezing inappropriately, by accident, that I would tear his head off. Right, right, it's funny. That, you know, and, but that, and, that was, those words sweep the leg. You know, it's just, there, that, if you're gonna look at the history of motion pictures, that will always be played. There's yeah. something about that line that was so attractive to a mass audience. It was, and that, and, you know, and no mercy, it's, it's quite interesting. No, there's no way you would ever assume that to be so memorable when you're acting it, you know, and there's so many great moments. I mean, we talk about seeing great films. If you can remember five moments in a film to communicate to someone else who hasn't seen the movie, mm -hmm. it is for sure a hit you know, f five, maybe even right. four. You know, to me, the ultimate 
I think the ultimate, uh, I'm big into Westerns, but the ultimate action picture is Raiders of the Lost Ark to me. You know, the ultimate Western to me is the Wild Bunch, Red River, mm -hmm. Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. You know, these are, you can talk about four or five of these great moments, just like you could talk about Stanley Kowalski screaming right. Stella. Right, you know. exactly. Well, let's talk about the Six Gun Savior. Yes. That's a new movie that's going to be out soon, I think mm -hmm. in April. Yes. We're going to see a clip. If you can lead us into this clip they're about to see. Tell us about the movie. Well, it's a film called Six Gun Savior, and it stars Eric Roberts and myself. And it's really a surreal Western. Westerns are tough to make these days, and the way, the true way to get them financed is to unfortunately put a little bit of some alien-esque activity. You know, a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of surrealism. Because I'm a big fan of, of s straight westerns, like The Searchers, Red River, Wild Bunch. You certainly got the look. <laughs> you know, but they don't make them. You know, the problem is they don't. I did wire up with Kevin Costner. I cried when I left the set. I mean, I had such a good time. It's what I wanted to do. This one is the devil. This character is really the devil. And the fascinating thing about it for an actor was, you know how much power you have as the devil and you're playing a poker game. And you could eat these fellows, you could crush them into, but because you want to win the poker game, you play the game with these guys. And I had such a good time as an actor, knowing all that power I had as the devil, as the ultimate of all, Lucifer, and yet you play it down because you just want to win the game like a mortal you never get a chance to be a mortal now you have a chance to be a mortal and you're dressed up in cowboy gear wow this is well, this is fun watch. let's watch this yeah, clip and can't wait to see that's why i enjoy this so much okay let's watch marty cove i'll raise so what do you say we uh, up the stakes if my hand is better than yours i get to take yours my what? Your hand. Well, preferably the one with all them shiny rings. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're crazy, you know that? Why don't you just play your cards? Beat three queens. Oh. All right. Just in case you are wondering, you ain't much fun. Full house. Now, about that hand. You are crazy. Why don't you just take them rings here, okay? We call this square. Hey, come on, I, I wasn't being serious. Hey! Maybe just a little. That'd be very successful, very successful. And uh, Eric Roberts is in that movie. And he plays, he's the only character who has more power than I do. He's truly the epitome of evil. But we have such a good time playing back and forth. Um, I mean, it just was, it, it's, it's great. I mean, doing a Western for me is just the epitome of, I could live, if I could do a one Western a year and a play, some, you know, wonderful classic revival of Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams, I, I would do nothing. I'd really? just sit home. You like theater? I love theater. It's wonderful. In fact, I just found, a, I just found the, the Rainmaker, Burt Lancaster and Catherine Hepburn. Sure, I just, Starbuck. Yeah, Starbuck. And I, I used to do it in class a lot, and I just found a DVD of it in a collector's uh, shop. And my daughter, Rachel, is now fascinated by... Marlon Brando and Burt Lancaster, and she's starting class, and she's very good. And so I want to do this with her, and maybe even go to class. I'll let her play, you know, let her play Katherine Hepburn's role, and I'll play Starbuck, and, you know, let her play Lizzie, and we'll just have some fun, you know. Wow, but you've had 80, over 80 films under your belt right now. Some you're proud of. Some, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you proud of, I heard you have, a doll 
There's actually, I know, I've got a bobblehead <laughs> here, but um, you have a, a doll? We had a doll that came out, uh, it was Hasbro doll, a big one, in the 80s. And then last year they came out with another doll, a smaller doll. And it's about this big, and it's really fun. And um, it's just a guess, because I give it to those people who really just, you know, love the movie and all. I gave it to my granddaughter. I just, you know, it was my very first grandchild. And she looked at it, and she played with it. And she didn't even tear it apart. She just realized that it was a collector's edition item. There. <laughs> and, she, uh, you know, and then I gave it to her as a, uh, I think it was, it was Christmas time, Hanukkah time. And I, I gave her a signed book of Dumbo signed by Walt Disney with uh -huh. my doll. Maybe this will just, they'll stay around for years, I hope. You know? And we hope you do too. Thank you. Because we are so delighted that you made the trek up here to be on our show. And I'm sure that this, the uh, new movie, the six pack. Six gun savior. Six gun, I'm thinking beers, right? It's all right. It's Western, right? You think of a saloon. I'm, um, I'm very happy that you're here. and. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, you're very it. kind. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Martin. Martin Cove. Thank you, Martin. Well, that's our show for tonight. Joining us for our next show will be the actress Judy Norton, who's best remembered as Mary Ellen, the eldest daughter from the television show The Waltons. And our Thai Babylonia will be returning next week as well. So for our guest, Martin Cove, and for our director, George Montavo, and the entire KBL crew, I'm Ken Boxer. Good night, everybody, and thank you so very much for being here. Ken Boxer Live is brought to you by the following sponsors. Terry Riken Realtor at Sotheby's, your broker with a personal touch. Palazzo Restaurant, where people don't leave hungry or thirsty. Harbor View Inn. Santa Barbara's premier four diamond luxury boutique oceanfront hotel. Wendy Foster, Santa Barbara and Montecito's premier clothing store. The Eagle Inn, a family owned hotel near the beach in Santa Barbara. Marjoram Wine Company, handcrafted wines and committed to excellence. Via Rosa Inn, let us pamper you in international style. The Wine Cast, Serving seasonal California cuisine with Santa Barbara's largest wine list. La Quinta Inn and Suites, conveniently located in downtown Santa Barbara. Taffy's Pizza, delivery, pickup, or dine in. And by Country Catering, Meat Market, and Deli. Gandolfo's New York Deli. Santa Barbara Bar. Jack's Bagels and Bistro. Lido's Takeout, Paul Mitchell, The School, Ice in Paradise, The Santa Barbara Access Card, Perfect Computers, The Ken Boxer Live Musical Theme by Mr. Michael J. Leslie. From all of us at Ken Boxer Live, I'm Baron Ron Heron. Good night, everyone.